Good evening, and welcome to our armchair conversation with Ambassador Earthrin Cousin. I'm Dr. Marian Diaz, the Director of Wisdom Ways Center for Spirituality. So Wisdom Ways, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a center for spirituality, and we focus a lot on education. We focus a lot on exploring different spiritualities and really looking at questions of how people live their spiritualities and their passion in life. Just also want to send a greeting to those who will be watching at a later date. I'm just so excited that um, I get to share with you this evening all of the amazing work of Ambassador Cousin, a little bit about her story. I think Ambassador Cousin is an amazing example of that. So in, in true celebration of International Women's Day, I am actually going to share her whole bio with you because she is um, beyond incredible. Ambassador Earthrin Cousin currently serves as the CEO and Managing Director of Food Systems for the Future, a Nutrition Impact Investment Fund. She is also a Distinguished Fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, a Bosch Academy Robert Weisaker Fellow, and as a visiting scholar at the Stanford University Center on Food Security and Environment. From 2012 to 2017, Cousin led the United, Nation, the United Nations World Food Program. As executive director, Cousin guided the 14,000 member World Food Program team, feeding more than 80 million people each year while she identified and championed longer term, more sustainable solutions to global food insecurity and hunger. In 2009, Cousin was nominated and confirmed as US ambassador to the UN agencies for food and agriculture in Rome. Prior to her global hunger work, Cousin helped lead the US domestic fight to end hunger, including service as the executive vice president and Chief Operating Officer of America's Second Harvest, now known as Feeding America. Cousin is currently a member of the Bayer AG Supervisory Board, the Mondelez International Board of Directors, the Royal DSM Sustainability Board, and a trustee of the African Agriculture Think Tank, Academia 2063. Cousin is a graduate of the University of Illinois at Chicago, University of Georgia Law School, and the University of Chicago Executive Management Program um, for finance for non-financial executives. So get this, she has been listed numerous times <laughs> on the Forbes 100 Most Powerful Women list as the Fortune Most Powerful Women in Food and Drink, on Time's 100 Most Influential People list, and as one of the 500 most powerful people on the planet by Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, I just really can't say enough how um, pleased I am to know her and excited to um, have you hear from her this evening. So, um, Ambassador Cousin, as, as I was saying, um, really just like to hear about how you got into this passion and how that story of your passion really developed for feeding the hungry of the world. Well, first of all, let me thank you for this invitation to join you tonight in this conversation and to talk to your students and the members of your community about this work of addressing the issue of food security. And then let's set some ground rules for this conversation. Uh, and the, the one ground rule is uh, Earthering, please. Okay. Uh, I appreciate the recognition of my service as U.S. ambassador, and thank you very much for that. And if my mother ever goes on and sees this, <laughs> she'll be very pleased that she did. But you and I know each other, and we're both servant leaders. And so let's talk to each other like we do when we have these conversations uh, when the cameras aren't rolling. So I, I will not call you doctor and you will no. not call me ambassador. No. <laughs> okay, so what got me started? Um, I'm very seriously, I, I, I was born to this. If I ever write a book, that's the title, Born This Way. Wow. Um, I grew up in a family where food was, as it is in so many families, at the center of our, our relationships. Everything we did was around a meal. Uh, whenever there was, whether it was joy or whether it was pain, uh, you brought out food. 
uh, that's part that's part of the traditions of the African American community that it's about food. But what made I think my family really different, and and and, and so I, I know there's someone sitting out there who say my family did the same thing, but there was always a seat at the table for mm -hmm. anybody who could not afford a meal. We lived in one of the famous Chicago two flats where my grandmother lived downstairs and oh, we sweet. lived upstairs. <laughs> And my, there were always people at my grandmother's house because they knew that the times were hard. You can go to go see Nana and she, she'd fix you something to eat. She was the lady who sold candy on the porch, which uh, meant that her door was always open. And so that, that, that drew in um, the community and what that did for us as children was instilled in us a responsibility for those who have much to share. Uh, and then you you, com you com compound my grandmother, this family of, of food lovers and foodies before foodies even <laughs> popped is even a word that we, we acknowledge uh, with a father who was, as I like to say, a community organizer before Barack Obama made it popular. And he was very much involved in every single community organization on the west side of the city of Chicago in Lawndale. He was one of those leaders who believed that the way to change our community was by, by being involved. Um, and so, and he was also a chef. Uh, and, mm. and my grandmother owned restaurants, my dad owned bars, my dad owned restaurants. And so we grew up peeling potatoes in their kitchen and participating mm. while at the same time participating in local elections by serving as the, the, the kids passing out literature for candidates that were progressive candidates in the community. So born this way. And the last piece is that it's in my blood, not just in my experience. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was, and my mother doesn't let me say sharecropper, he was a farm laborer mm -hmm. in Washington, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And for most of his, his youth and, and through his adult life until uh, he went, he was, he, he was older and he went to work at the mill. But he believed in growing food to feed his family, to feed, to support his community. They were, they were people who not just work the fields, but uh, there were, there was, there was always a hog in his backyard that he was, he was fattening up, that he would feed his family and share food with the, with the community. So th this is, this is born and bred who I am uh, experientially, uh, who I became. Um, and I always say my sisters grew up and, 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 and found real jobs and I made a passion and I followed my passion and continue to work in the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it kind of sounds like the, it was also the family business, just very integral to who you are and just natural in terms very of natural. you just like wanting to feed babies. <laughs> wanting to feed babies, wanting to feed everybody. You know, I smiled because my, we, yes, it was very much the family business. My dad was a terrible businessman. Okay. Uh, and so none of these restaurants was ever a success because they fed people whether they had money or not. And so while that is, will feed your passion, it doesn't and ring the cash register. And so yeah. he actually ended his career as the uh, head of food services for the Salvation Army. Because after working as an entrepreneur in these businesses where he was trying to feed the community while also trying to make a living, we realized that, uh, that uh, maybe he needed to get, as they say, go, go get a real job. <laughs> uh, and so mm -hmm. he then, but he didn't go and look for a, a, a job in, in, in a, in a, in a in somebody else's restaurant. He used all those mm -hmm. skills that he developed to, to develop menus that would, on the budgets that the Salvation Army could afford, provide good food mm -hmm. as well as nutritious food yeah. for primarily men across the city of Chicago. Wow. What a powerful, yeah, example and yeah, it's, it's witness. For when you, you and, yeah. see it every yeah. day, yeah. And, and you know, this wasn't something for, for, the, for the responsibility to, to serve, to ensure access to nutritious food 
for everyone was not something my family talked about. It was something they did. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, I'm really excited. Would you share with us what you would sort of identify as some of your more um, impactful projects and activities when you were serving as the director of the World Food Program? During that time, just a few stories. Thank you so much for that question <laughs> because um, you know, too often when people think about the World Food Program and we think about uh, emergency food assistance, we think about bloated babies with bloated bellies, babies with flies on their eyes, uh, emaciated children uh, who are suffering from chronic, from severe malnutrition. Uh, I saw them, yes. And, 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 and we addressed those issues. Uh, and we say, and we, we lost a lot of babies, but we also saved a lot of babies. And those aren't the children you see. You don't see the ones that are thriving. Mm -hmm. You don't see mm -hmm. wow. the child yeah. that, that sat on my lap in Haiti when her mother was so proud to put this child who had on a white t-shirt and white shorts with not a speck of dirt on it with fat and happy um, because, and everything around her said she didn't have very much. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she lived in a house with a dirt floor. Um, she was surviving on less than $2 a day. Mm -hmm. uh, but she, with the support from the programs that we developed and implemented in Haiti, was able to provide the, the, the supplemental food that her child needed because he was about eight months old. She was still breastfeeding him and she was able to provide him with nutritious food from her breast because she was healthy. Yes. yes. And the, yeah. then this baby was healthy. And so those are the babies that don't make the six o'clock news. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what people need to see because they need to understand that the emergency and the humanitarian support that they provide saves lives, but it also changes lives. Mm -hmm. And it creates uh, hope where none existed. I'll tell you another story. I was mm -hmm. sitting with um, I was sitting with a group of mothers in South Sudan where oh. Um, yeah. where the women, it was the, the, con the, the conflict in South Sudan, and for those of you who don't know, is our youngest nation uh, that has been in conflict mm -hmm. more than at peace since it became a nation. Um, and many of the men find themselves a part of the conflict and the women sheltering and attempting to feed and care for their children. And these women had walked from a conflict area and they were walking to e Ethiopia into um, a um, refugee camp. And so we met them midway with food. Uh, but the, before they arrived at this way station where we were providing food of support, they were feeding their babies lily pads uh -huh. along the way just to keep their <clears throat> stomachs full. Mm -hmm. No nutritional value, just calories to keep their stomachs mm -hmm. full. And uh, the children, though, were playing duck, duck, goose. My, my, one of my <laughs> colleagues taught them to play. Because what you saw was here were children who had, by every definition, nothing. Yeah. But they had mothers who loved them that were keeping them alive. They had mothers who sat on the ground with them and talked to me. And when I asked them, what did they want me to tell the world about them? Mm -hmm. And they started talking to each other in their own language. And one of them said through our interpreter, she said, I want you to tell the world, don't forget us. Uh. I want you to tell the world that, that we want our children to be educated because we want them to have, particularly our girls, mm -hmm. we want them to have um, more opportunities in the future. And I want you to tell the world that, that we want the opportunity to grow food, to raise food, and so that we can feed our own children. Wow. We appreciate yeah. the help that yeah. you're giving us today, mm -hmm. but our goal is to feed our own children. Mm -hmm. We want peace so we can feed our own children. I could have had that conversation with a mother on the west side of Chicago, mm -hmm. the west side of New York, or in Minneapolis, and you would have heard exactly almost the same thing. The words may have been different. But what we want for our mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. wherever you sit, it's just not very different. 
And too often we don't, we don't realize that there's more uh, community in our desires for peace, prosperity, and opportunity yeah. that limit our ability to see people and to see them beyond their situation mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that we can provide the assistance and support that is necessary to help them move beyond that situation. Mm -hmm. And so that was what excited me at the World Food Program was mm -hmm. because, uh, yes, I, I can tell you lots of stories about uh, the flying into Nepal after the earthquake and, and going up the side of the mountain to provide emergency assistance to families who otherwise couldn't get down the mountain because we were able to, but we were able to provide them with food. I can tell you about the, the children that I saw in, in, uh, Kenya where, who had walked with their mothers from Somalia, uh, and they were more skin, more skin um, and bones than muscle and fat. Um, but what I want you, what I'm hoping your viewers will take away from this is the, that it is not just the challenges of meeting humanitarian needs, mm -hmm. but is the ability that we have uh, as a global community to support the opportunity for everyone to live a more prosperous life. And that was what mm -hmm. changed, the, what, 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 what kept me going at WFP was that you were giving people the opportunity mm -hmm. for another day that was a better day. Yeah, wow. And really just, and, and we will talk more later in the interview just about you know addressing these issues systemically. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of what you're talking about that's in exactly. terms of education, um, financial opportunity, just agriculture and, and just at the heart of it, um, as you said, being seen yes. and being heard and not being forgotten. I think that that message for me in some ways too, um, is really powerful during, you know, today is international women's mm -hmm. day. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what international women's day means to you. And especially given the theme for this year, which is breaking the bias. Break the International Women's Day. I am so glad we're celebrating it. Happy International Yay. Women's Day to everyone. Uh, it, it's it's really interesting. When, unlike when you say Merry Christmas to someone at the holiday and everybody says Merry Christmas. When you say Happy International Women's Day, they look at you and go, oh, okay. Wait, Happy what is that? In, a, in the United States, it's like, wait, is that wait, a holiday? Is that a holiday? <laughs> Am I working today? Uh, but uh, yeah, what does it mean? It means that we, we, we do what we should do three, the other 364 days a year, and that is we acknowledge the, the role of women in, in the, the success that we seek to achieve as a nation, as a community, as families, um, that we um, acknowledge the, the need for diversity in all of our uh, all of our teams all of our uh, decision making that ensures that we when we solve problems that we 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 take the time to acknowledge the importance of having a gender lens on the solutions that we develop because oftentimes mm -hmm. the solutions mm -hmm. that we 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 define and 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 that we commit to are not solutions that meet the needs of of the entire population that we serve because often right. when, today even in 2022 um the 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 the, the Women remain the primary caretakers of our family. Mm -hmm. They are the primary uh, the, uh, chefs and cooks of our food. They're the, the and, and in, in places of, across the globe, they are the, the, the primary um, workers, laborers in, 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 in the agriculture system. 60% uh, of all the smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa are women. Wow. And so our failure <clears throat> to wow. acknowledge wow. the role of gender and of women and the, what is necessary in many of these societies where women have the responsibility to work but not the right to own the land, 
Uh, and so they don't have the access to the capital or the mm -hmm. tools that are necessary to, to uh, productively to productively work the land in a way that um, would provide them with the maximum benefit for themselves and their families. Um, all of those issues as we sit here in 2022 are still very much at the top of the challenges mm -hmm. that affect the progress that communities can make because we don't acknowledge the, the importance of, uh, of, of the work of women. And the and the rights of women and the and the and the roles uh, that that women perform both in the home, outside the home, and in in and where they should perform them in boardrooms, in leadership yeah. positions. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. as a result, what we have, a, we we're, we we lack the diversity that is necessary yeah. in our in our in our decision making that will ensure that we create the solutions that appropriately serve all of the people of those communities. And, and don't start me about <laughs> the issues of women of color. I, I, because, yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> because I'd like to will, start that. Well, because then you, you, let's compound the challenge. Yeah. Because oftentimes what you will hear from men is, yes, I need to, I need to acknowledge gender because, you know, I, my wife and my daughters, but their daughter doesn't look like me. And they're, yeah. they're not often. They're, does their wife look like me? That's changing, but mm -hmm. um, but as a result, when we talk about uh, breaking the bias, ensuring that we are addressing and the gender issues, we don't also take into the race and culture mm -hmm. and ethnicity issues mm -hmm. that also are very much that are very prevalent in that bias calculation that yeah. limits our ability yeah. to make the types of decisions that will ensure that we can have a, a, a broader and more equitable set of mm -hmm. solutions. Yeah. And just, I think in leadership in general, people don't realize that the more diverse voices you have at the table, the actually higher quality decisions you do make in ways that are more effective and have greater impact across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been shown, but it's just the challenge is really also then finding support for those women of color mm -hmm. in leadership roles mm -hmm. and really hearing them and yes. and <clears throat> letting their voices and stories have that impact to cause change and Yes, the, yeah. the, the, you, I, yeah. someone was asking me <laughs> just earlier today, have I ever been in one of those rooms where I wasn't seen? I said, oh, oh I'm not immune. <laughs> I'm not immune. Yeah. And yeah. so, and they wanted me to give them an example. I said, the <laughs> one that you hear from women that 80% um, of the women out there have, have experienced at one time in their career or other. And that is sitting in a room with your colleagues um, and uh, discussing an issue and you raise a point and the room is silent. Mm -hmm. And five minutes later, one of your male colleagues says the yep. exact same yep. thing. Yep. And everyone says, what a great idea. Yep. And they applaud yep. it. And the other women in the room look at you and say, yeah. Didn't you just say yeah. that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you, I had that table turned when I was, um, when I was at the United Nations, when I was at the World Food Program, mm -hmm. and we're sitting at one of those tables, and and uh, Antonio Guterres, who is now the Secretary General at the time, was the head of UNHCR, okay. and he was a good friend, and and it was one of those situations where I raised what I thought was a very uh, important point, uh, and they went without little with with. with with little regard from those sitting around the table when the conversation went on and not five minutes later, not maybe, maybe five, but not 10 minutes later, one of my male colleagues ahead of another UN organization raises a, the exact same point. Mm -hmm. And Antonio mm -hmm. in, in pure Antonio way, now Secretary General says, didn't Urchman just say that? <laughs> and so what that tells you was how important having allies are. Yes, yes. 
to ensuring yes. that you're not in this battle alone. Yes. Because that backed everybody down. It was like, oh yeah, she did. Well, what, why, my, there's a distinction between what I said and what uh-huh. she said, and I'm saying, but it was it was backpedaling because he mm-hmm. he and others around the table knew he'd been called mm-hmm. on what too often doesn't get called. Yep. Which is why I'm so glad he's Secretary General now, because you Yay. have somebody who's sitting in the chair who gets it. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Wonderful. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you for sharing around that. Um, so, you know, as a part of Wisdom Way's role as just educational, mm-hmm. I was wondering if for those of us who maybe aren't as familiar with food issues, if you would talk about sort of the main elements of food security and what that really means. Sure. The Food and Agriculture Organization defines food security as food availability, affordability, which is also accessibility, because if it's available, uh-huh. but it's not affordable, and utilization, consumption. If, if the food is available and affordable, but you don't have access to clean water, so as a result, you uh, suffer from an inability to to digest the food and to absorb the micronutrients in the food, you don't have food security. So you need all three Mm -hmm. elements Mm -hmm. in order to support uh, what is a food secure diet. Okay. And so yeah. we, but you know, when, and, and as we talk about food security, the, the last year, um, we, the, we, the global community, the UN um, convened a food system summit. And I'm so sad because most people don't <laughs> know the UN convened a food system summit, <laughs> even though the United States made some significant commitments mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. the summits, not just for what they will do internationally, but what they will do here at home to address the challenges of our own food system, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But, Mm -hmm. um, and so what came, the the outcome of that food system summit was that yes, we must have a food system that supports our food security, but we need a just transition of that food, uh, of our food system to create a a just and sustainable food system. And what does that mean? It means Mm -hmm. a food system that meets our health needs, mm-hmm. as I've just described mm-hmm. them, but also our environmental needs. Right. That right. what mm-hmm. what many people don't know is that 25% of all the greenhouse gases are generated from the food system. And oh, wow. that the yeah. food system is also the most vulnerable system to climate crisis because the rains don't come, yes, of course. the rains are long, yes. Yes. or we are more prone to flooding because of mm-hmm. the, the, the challenges of the changes in climate and a more erratic climate. Um, and so the, we, we know that the, the, the projections, the projection, the population projections are that we'll have nine and a half billion to 10 billion people by 2050, which means that we need to increase global food production by about 50%. Wow. But we need to do that within planetary boundaries, which means yes. that we need to yes. grow more yes. on the land that is already under cultivation and not expand into more land and, and detrimentally impacting biodiversity, detrimentally mm-hmm. impacting our right. forests and detrimentally right. impacting our wetlands around the globe. Um, and so th- th- that means more innovation to support a more environmentally supportive food system. And so you have the health of a food system that meets our health needs, our environmental needs, but also our economic needs. The challenge of our food system today, one of the one of the major challenges of our food system today is a lack of economic return for all the actors across the food system, particularly farmers. We have 500 mm-hmm. million smallholder farmers and mm-hmm. we have farmers right here in the United States who are aging out of the business or being forced to work two jobs in order to keep their farms working because they don't make enough from their land. They don't, they, while they're producing their, their productive farms, but they are not generating enough income from those farms to support their livelihoods mm-hmm. there. And, and that is true in the United States as, as much as is, is true in Sub-Saharan Africa wow. or in, in Latin America. And so mm-hmm. how do we embrace the true cost of foods and begin to pay our farmers, begin to support mm-hmm. the, the, uh, the return on investment for all the actors across the food systems, the laborers who work in our processing plants and in our, in, 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 um, 
our factories that 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 produce our food? How do we ensure that the investors who invest in businesses that uh, that scale up to provide more nutritious food also get the appropriate and fair return mm-hmm. that they have? So that mm-hmm. economic return of the food system is also quite critical to creating an equitable, just, and sustainable uh, food system. Yeah, and. Well, and one of the things I've been reading about lately, too, is that some extra funding for Black farmers in particular, now that was designated as being held up. Yeah, well, that's that's a, that's, that's, I, how much time do we have? That's a long conversation. (laughs) All right. But let's talk about Black farmers, okay? Yeah, I I think it's, it's, it's important for us to talk about Black farmers. We've lost over 15 million acres of land between 1910 and today uh, that was owned by Black farmers. Uh, mm-hmm. Then through through air property, through eminent domain, through tax sales, all of the kinds of of, uh, of, of every every legal method that you can you can you can identify, we've lost land. We are down to less than fifty thousand black farmers in this family in this country, mm-hmm. producing less than one percent of the agricultural production. Um, and farmers who want to get into the business mm-hmm. can't afford the land. Mm-hmm. Uh, oftentimes land in communities where their families historically farmed and, and could not make a living. Uh, the, 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 their heirs can no longer afford that, the access to that land. And so, and, 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 and I am, have, have been, I was selected by um, Secretary Vilsack to serve as a commissioner for how can USDA more equitably serve the farmers wow. in this country. And so there, there are 15 commissioners and okay. we are looking at every single USDA program uh, mm-hmm. as well as the services that they provide uh, in the communities because it's not just about capital, it's the capacity, the, mm-hmm. the training black farmers and, and brown farmers uh, and uh, mm-hmm. women farmers mm-hmm. have not yes. had access yeah. to those trainings in, um, but the, in, from, the, from the USDA. There have been two lawsuits filed by Black farmers, the Pickford lawsuits that were filed by Black farmers here in the United States, and the government's lost both of them. And the court found discrimination Mm -hmm. in both of those cases. And where there were small settlements, the lawyers made most of the money, as they do in a lot of class action suits, the farmers received very little financial return. And the problem is the actions that generated the findings of discrimination in too many cases continue to go on. Uh-huh. And so that is why we need this equity commission yes. to really identify what are the practices and program changes that are required to create that, stru- that structural uh, uh, change in the system, those system mm-hmm. changes mm-hmm. that will provide for more opportunities for farmers in the future. Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad I asked that question. So, um, maybe I'll let you take a little drink, a little breather. Because, <laughs> um, you know, it sounds like I hit on one of the exciting projects you're working on, but mm-hmm. what are some of the most exciting things you're working on currently? Well, that, that, that's on. exciting. Yeah, yeah, that hear. is a great one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great one. Yeah. We just started, we just had our first public meeting last week uh, with the commission uh, and, and Secretary Vilsack opened up the meeting with so passionately talking about how he, as this is his second term serving as secretary and how he wants to, for him success as secretary of of agriculture this time is very much about bringing equity and justice to the USDA, uh, as well as providing for the agricultural productivity Mm -hmm. of our country, because there's a Mm -hmm. recognition that unless we can ensure that there's an equity of opportunity, that we will not fully benefit from the the increased productivity of an agriculture system for all the people. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, that I'm excited about that work. I'm just as excited about the work um, that that I am performing with this the organization that we set up that you mentioned in Mm -hmm. your introduction, Food Systems for the Future. Food Systems for the Future is an outgrowth of um, an investment by the Rockefeller Foundation, BCG, and Stanford University, working with me and a team of um, of, of ex- food security experts to, to we, where we performed a landscape 
to identify what are the challenges for scaling up market businesses, uh, both domestically yeah. and, and not just yes. not new programs, but businesses yeah. of, uh, across the food system. Um, and, and we looked at, at the United States, we looked at East Africa, West Africa, and we even looked at China. Um, and what we found was that, particularly in the United States and in Africa, is that you have all kinds of programs for, for uh, starting businesses, whether it's incubators, accelerators, mm -hmm. grant programs, X prizes to get, um, to get businesses started. Uh, we also found that, that nobody starts more businesses in the United States, even in the food space, than Black women. Uh, yet, after after mm -hmm. five years of business of a Black woman and a white woman, the disparity in the incomes that those businesses are generating across the board, I, they, they, I'm sure there are examples that you can talk about on both sides, but on average, is a 10% or a... Um, 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 almost a 50% difference wow. in the incomes where, wow. yeah. um, where because what we found is there's a redlining of, uh -huh. of investment in, in uh, black and brown entrepreneurs um, in, and from traditional VC capital as well as from commercial capital. And the, 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 it's all based on what is the, how do we define risk? We define black communities yep. as too risky. We define black entrepreneurs as too risky. We define um, brown women entrepreneurs as too risky uh, because they lack the history. The communities lack the return. Um, and so we, if they can get, to, if, if a business, if whether regardless of whether it's owned by black or, or a majority owner, if, if once they reach a certain financial level, capital is easier to access. There's still, I can give you lots of anecdotal evidence around, even at that level, mm -hmm. the, the, the challenge of accessing capital by black business owners, but it's, it's, it's easier. But the, the, the challenge of getting to scale to even yes. compete at yes. that level yes. is almost yes. impossible. So what we decided to do was step into that impossibility. And mm -hmm. to um, what we identified was that it was not just about the capital. Uh, it was also about ensuring that we provided the ecosystem, the, uh -huh. the policy yeah. support, the partnership yeah. support, the yeah. business operation support that would allow those businesses to scale as, as well as providing them with the capital mm -hmm. to ensure their capacity to scale. Mm -hmm. And so we are ambitious and we have a team where we stood up here in the United States, as well as a team that we've stood up in Rwanda. Uh, performing similar work in Rwanda. Um, and just talking about the team here in the United States, we have just launched the first fundraise for our first fund. Um, we have a proof of concept fund that we're working to raise for $25 million. And knock on wood, we yeah. have two um, anchor investors Wonderful. that we are now in due diligence with. Uh, we're trying to raise $25 million. And if, if they come on board after this due diligence process, we'll have about 10 of it in the bank. Um, and mm -hmm. then that hopefully will open the doors that will allow us to, we have a pipeline of some 600 companies that we've identified. Uh, and we have a first 10 that we're prepared to work with who are many to five, five of those 10 actually have kept spaces open in their round, their raising round for capital because they want us as a partner uh, because they want to make a difference in the nutrition in the communities that we're talking about. And they want to have the support and the services that we provide. So they want us uh, as, as part owners in their business. And so wow. I'm really yeah, excited that's... about that work. Um, I, 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 I'm also a fellow at the Chicago Council uh, where I continue to perform research around issues related to food security. We published a paper about a year ago on the challenges of water and food security. Um, mm, which yes. did you know that all ninety yes. percent of all the of the the fresh water on, on the that we that's consumed on an annual basis we use in food system production. Wow! From agriculture okay. through how we wash our food in our kitchens. Ninety percent. Ninety percent of all of the yeah. fresh water that is consumed wow. on yeah. an annual basis. 
Uh, and that didn't mean a lot until we started shrinking the aquifers right. and having right. challenges with our groundwater and the mm -hmm. glaciers are, are, are melting as quickly as they are and women and creating food, fresh water crisis across, not just the, the, the places over in Sub-Saharan Africa, but in central United States, in the most productive uh, regions of California where we grow all of our fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And so right. the yeah. water food yeah. security is a big issue. So yeah. spending time working on those kinds of issues. Uh, and then um, and I, I am, I'm passionate about having the, the ability to give voice to what is necessary for a just transition of the food system. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'm going to surprise you with, with, the, oh, with good. that. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> that uh, when you talk about the, the leaders who speak and who have, who have access to the platform that is necessary to support the advocacy work that is required for us to bring more um, and you know, partners and countries and donors and financiers into this food systems transition. I am usually the only person who looks like me sitting at that table, whether I'm sitting in Washington, D.C. Okay, sorry, that Rome, wasn't a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Rome some of the years you were in. This is not a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and so while some would say, Earthman, you should just focus on food system for the future. I don't think God gave me these gifts right. and this talent and this, this, um, this passion yeah, about this fire, work yeah. to focus on one thing. Right. So yeah, that's what wow. I'm doing now. That's awesome. That's great. Well, so as we, you know, we're sort of holding the date and planning this a few months ago, who would have known what would be going on? in the world um, at this time, but I know you've been busy the last few days and I'd just like to hear how um, you see the war in Ukraine impacting um, global access to food and- Well, it's, it's we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're as, as a global community, we're focused as we should be on the people of, of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And the now two million refugees that some say could yeah. could go to as much as seven million refugees, and those who are men putting their their, their wives and their children on on, on trains yeah. to try and get them out, women delivering babies in hallways because hospitals are closed or bombed. Uh, you saw the babies being moved from ICU units into into trains and, and train stations so that they could get them to to uh, facilities where they could continue to provide the support that was necessary. Necessary. What the world is just beginning to recognize or realize is that Ukraine, the, 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 we often describe Ukraine as the breadbasket of Europe, mm -hmm. um, that the Ukraine and Russia together produce about 30% of all of the wheat that is consumed across the globe on an annual basis. But what mm -hmm. we also don't, um, we don't uh, Fully, did not fully recognize is mm -hmm. until now is that between Belarus, which is, is um, we have now, there are now sanctions on Belarus, Russia and Ukraine, mm -hmm. all, much of the potash uh, that supports our fertilizers um, is produced in those countries as well. So what we're now seeing are wheat futures that are skyrocketing because, not just because the farmers in Ukraine have stopped farming, because the rural areas are oftentimes, and this, the Ukraine is no different, the first areas where you have uh, bombs that are mm -hmm. dropped and so farmers don't farm if, if their, their physical security of themselves and their family are limited. And so during a period of time when farmers should be in the farm, in the fields planting for the next harvest, they're not mm -hmm. out there. So that affects the, those who import wheat from, from Ukraine, which is, the, which is the North Africa and the Middle East and uh, Turkey, Egypt. Um, but the, uh, and so yeah. you, you, that's the, the, you can see that the, but the externalities that, that you don't see are the high price of, of, um, 
of fertilizer and the effect that that will have, not just on poor, the 500 million uh, smallholder farmers that produce about 80% of the food that is consumed in the countries where they farm, but also on farmers in Iowa. And so uh-huh. we know that when farmers use less fertilizer, that they get less yield. Um, right. And so right. where farmers don't have and can't afford the fertilizer that they need, we will have a longer term uh, reduction in, in yields, not just in wheat thin, but also in corn. Mm-hmm. Um, we will also, we're, we, so you have high futures, you have increased gas prices. We're mm-hmm. seeing gas prices mm-hmm. that have not been this high mm-hmm. since the 2008 food crisis. Um, you have um, the the um, the, tr- the challenge of a net exporting country, um, the Ukraine, and the effect that that will have on net importing countries. And as the all of those factors become more um, they become more pronounced, we will, the, the, the concern is that you will, we will, will result in export bans because if we're not, if we're not uh, growing mm-hmm. enough food mm-hmm. in the net exporting countries that we'll see export bans where countries try to protect their own yes. food security. Yes. And what that means is that then in the net importing countries, the Hades, the Ghanas, the mm-hmm. Ethiopia, the places where we depend on a functioning global food system, um, you will see higher price food. And the one thing, my, I've spent a lot of time researching the relationships between conflict and, and hunger. And we, what the data does not support is a direct causal relationship between hunger and conflict and instability. But what the data does support mm-hmm. is a direct causal relationship between mm-hmm. acute high food prices yes. and instability in countries that depend upon the import of that food. Particularly when we see that instability occurring, when countries don't have the sovereign wealth to to support Mm -hmm. the purchase of food that would keep those prices at a level where working people can afford bread. Yes. Because the chronically hungry, the most vulnerable, They don't march in the streets. Mm -hmm. The people who march in the streets are the people who get up and work every day and Mm -hmm. then can't afford bread for their children. And the possibility of that happening, we're beginning to see all of those indicators that go from red to green um, as the conflict in Ukraine is affecting all of these other pieces that are, because we are so, our, our food system is so interconnected. And so the, the, what I've been working to do since, since the, we started watching uh, mm-hmm. Grain Futures mm-hmm. is uh, raising the alarm uh, yeah. with a group of, co- of cohorts around the, uh, around the globe who are working with me to develop the, 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 the pathways that the global community, but private sector, the UN government, the G7, the G20, the things that we need to do ahead of time yeah. to forestall a, uh, a, a high food price con- uh, crisis, mm-hmm. or at the very least to mitigate mm-hmm. the, the, the impact of a spike a significant spike in food prices. We see it coming. It's, it's the, the old adage, the too often you adage, you can see the train coming down the track. The question yeah. is, do we have, can we as a global community work together to hit the bricks in time to avoid an, an another 100 million, 200 million increase in the number of people who are food insecure across the globe? Because the other, yeah. the one other thing I need to add to yeah. this and yeah. make it a little even more disconcerting for you is that we, the number of people who were chronically food insecure, increased by a hundred million because of COVID. 
Uh, yes, and, of course. And, that was good. I don't need to COVID. ask you the next question. <laughs> yes. And so now yeah. it is those same communities, yes. many of those same communities and populations that will feel the effect of this high food price crisis if we don't address these issues in a timely way. Mm -hmm. And so you, you are exacerbating a problem that is already affecting food security for yes. so many. In, yes. in countries around the globe. Yeah. So you have the situation, the war in Ukraine, COVID and climate change all, you know, happening at a time when we actually really even just need to be ramping up yep. our systems. Yep. We what a challenge. We need to ramp up our systems. Yeah. But, and, and, and what one of my colleagues reminded me of this morning is, um, yes, we need to ramp up our systems. We need to ensure that we are investing in the seeds, the fertilizers for those smallholder farmers, ensuring the distribution to those who need it. Um, <clears throat> but we also need to ensure that as we, as we uh, address uh, this potential food crisis that we keep in mind a just transition of the food system yes. that we don't yes. perform in a way yes. that we will regret right. in the longer term that as we talk about the plan because what we know is that if you say um, we need to increase the production of wheat there's some countries that will begin to chop down more trees, mm -hmm. to expand the amount mm -hmm. of land that is under cultivation, to increase the profits that they can bring in mm -hmm. when future wheat prices are at the uh, uh, unprecedented level since in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and and um, so it is, it, is, it is an imperative that we perform in, in a manner that will keep us on track for supporting a more sustainable, but more productive mm -hmm. food system. So in your work and research, where do you see hope for that happening? I see hope for that happening because when I started texting people, they were responding. <laughs> I was, it's been fantastic. Whether it's the secretary general, I'm testing him on a Sunday morning. He said, I hear you, you know, tell me what you need me to do. Mm -hmm. Or it's the white house mm -hmm. where uh, the national security, this, this, I, I, I sent a memo out that my colleagues and I wrote over the weekend. Uh, and I, uh, we sent the memo out on, on Sunday. Today is Tuesday. We had a call this afternoon with representatives from the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, as well as from um, from the, the the Vice President's office, um, the, their their uh, economic policy advisor, and so people are paying the, the leadership is paying attention mm -hmm. to the bill that we are ringing. Yeah, um, and, and Paul Pullman, who was a former CEO of Unilever. Um, <clears throat> embrace and recognize the exact same challenges that the, and, and can see that same train and convene 15 CEOs from the largest agribusinesses across the globe yeah, on okay. Sunday night for four hours. And they started talking mm. about what are the things that we okay. can collectively do to make a difference. The questions have already been raised about what should the G7, G20, the EU, what should they all do? And they're beginning to build those narratives and plans for agribusiness and supporting some of the ideas about pathways forward that we are putting we're putting um, putting out there and so that gives me hope that um, 2007 and eight is is it may not be fresh in the minds of policy leaders um, and government leaders and even private sector leaders but it's a, 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 enough of a, a reminder to the of the global community of what happens without action. Yeah. Um, when you had in 2007 and eight, as I said, riots in 40 cities around the country. And it was when the number of food insecure people right. increased to a billion people. You remember those days yes. when yes. we were talking about a yes. billion hungry people? Yeah. It was directly yes. related to the food Food's price right. crisis. And then the last piece that, th yeah. that, that gives me hope is that there's a remembrance that many will argue that the Arab Spring started mm. with the high food price crisis. 
-hmm. because people could no longer, mm -hmm. the young people and working people could no longer afford rent. And so all of those, that, that's what gives me hope that there's a recognition by those who have the ability to make the decisions and invest the capital and provide the, po po the political will and public policy mm -hmm. um, changes that are necessary to ensure that we can, um, that we can avoid babies unnecessarily going home. Well, and I'm so, it's good to hear, right, that all of these different sectors of society are being pulled in, especially the corporate, you know, the corporate mm -hmm. leaders. And I mean, really, when you get down to it, you know, what was happening, we all have our family tables, mm -hmm. like you were describing, mm -hmm. um, whether you were someone who then became active in the Arab Spring or was protesting mm -hmm. 2007 or 2008, or whether you're the CEO who's leading this huge corporation, you still have your family table, right. you still have your need, um, to feed yourself and mm -hmm. your families and your community. And um, just, yeah, it's so basic and so fundamental of a need. It is so fundamental mm -hmm. of a need. Everybody under, everybody may not understand the geopolitical issues that are yeah. driving the conflict in, in the Ukraine today, but everybody understands uh, hunger, starving mm -hmm. children, uh, the inability to feed your family. Mm -hmm. um, we saw it right here in the United States. You know, you, you, when I talk about we need to, that the U.S. has committed to investing in our own food systems, uh -huh. we saw the failure of our food system here yeah. in the United States when we saw uh, lines. You will recall mm -hmm. during the early days mm -hmm. of COVID, you had lines yes. of people who could not mm -hmm. afford food. Uh, we had, and, and, and those who could afford it, you saw empty shelves in your mm -hmm. grocery store mm -hmm. when our food system failed. Mm -hmm. At the same time that we had farmers plowing under uh, fruits and vegetables that they did not have a market for and milk that they did not have a market to, to distribute into. Because we, what we recognized here in the United States is that our food system has never been more efficient. It has never, we've never had food that was as cheap as it is today, well, as a percentage of our incomes and a percentage mm -hmm. of, 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 uh, of, our, of, our, of, our, of our national spend uh, for our livelihoods. Um, but we don't have a food system that's agile. Mm -hmm. And we don't have mm -hmm. a food, we also saw a food system that wasn't supporting the health needs. We saw the, mm -hmm. the, the, a food system that that COVID illuminated the disparities of consumption and diet on health, uh, and we saw the comorbidity of diabetes and hypertension yes, yes. with COVID. And those are yes. all directly diet related diseases. Yes, yes. And so we recognize that we have a system that is failing uh, the, the, not just those farmers and our environment, but our human health. And it's not a problem, just a problem over there, it's a problem here at home. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about solutions and public will and what can people do who are yeah, that's who are listening how I sort to of us here end today. This conversation. What can people do? Yes. What do you first yeah. of all, as consumers, yeah, we need to recognize that farmers deserve a living wage. People who work in our factories and in, in our food production systems deserve a living wage, which means that we as consumers, we always say, I want better food, but we're not willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that we recognize that there is a cost to better food, to ensuring that we have a food system that, that is productive and that works and that we're willing to embrace that. But we also need a government that provides safety nets, that provide enough income, mm -hmm. that provide enough um, support, whether it's through our SNAP programs or our WIC programs that allow people to afford healthier food, where they're really nutrition programs and not programs where people are buying the cheapest food on the shelf. Uh, because they don't have enough money to go around. But that also means that um, we need people who are listening to us today to recognize that they need to stand up and demand living wages and, and support those Amen. who so support <laughs> those who are, are in positions of power that can provide for living wages. And I'll end by saying that we need people to care. 
I was on an elevator with an elected official once who told me, hey, Arthur, are you still feeding the babies? And I said, yes, sir, that's what I do. I worry about feeding the babies. He said, well, you know, nobody really cares. And as long as I can have an elected official say to me mm -hmm. that their voters don't care, right. then they won't take the actions that are necessary to change the situation on the, all of these issues that we've been talking about here today. So first and foremost, I need people to care and care mm -hmm. more than just by sitting in your living rooms, but by taking action with your yeah. elected officials, taking mm -hmm. action when in community organizing, taking actions, being part of your food banks, being part of the voice that demands change and demands better for everyone. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your openness, for just sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge with us today and just really want to encourage you in your work and I know it's really challenging to just know that our hearts and love are with you um, as you keep working on these important issues and we'll continue to have conversations at Wisdom Ways and locally and hopefully maybe people will start conversations regionally um, to continue to educate yourself on food issues and take real action um, on behalf of the needs of the hungry in our world. So, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.